bitter blooms. When he finally died, Sean found, to her shame, that she could not even bury him. She had no proper digging tools, only her hands, the long knife strapped to her thigh, and the smaller blade in her boot. But it would not have mattered. Beneath its sparse covering of snow, the ground was frozen hard as rock. Sean was sixteen, as her family counted years, and the ground had been frozen for half her lifetime. The season was deep winter, and the world was cold. Knowing the futility of it before she started, Sean still tried to dig. She picked a spot a few meters from the rude lean-to she had built for their shelter, broke the thin crust of the snow, and swept it away with her hands, and began to hack at the frozen earth with the smaller of her blades. But the ground was harder than her steel. The knife broke, and she looked at it helplessly knowing how precious it had been, knowing what Craig would say. Then she began to claw at the unfeeling soil, weeping until her hands ached and her tears froze within her mask. It was not right for her to leave him without burial. He had been father, brother, lover. He had always been kind to her, and she had always failed him. And now she could not even bury him. Finally, not knowing what else to do, she kissed him one last time. There was ice in his beard and his hair, and his face was twisted unnaturally by the pain and the cold, but he was still family, after all, and toppled the lean-to across his body, hiding him within a rough beer of branches and snow. It was useless, she knew. Vampires and wind wolves would knock it apart easily to get at his flesh, but she could not abandon him without shelter of some kind. She left him his skis and his big silver wood bow, its bowstring snapped by the cold. But she took his sword and his heavy fur cloak. It was little enough burden added to her pack. She had nursed him for almost a week after the vampire had left him wounded, and that long delay in the little lean-to had depleted most of their supplies. Now she hoped to travel light and fast, she strapped down her skis, standing next to the clumsy grave she had built him, and said her last farewell leaning on her poles. Then she set off over the snow, through the terrible silence of the deep winter woods, toward home and fire and family. It was just past midday. By dusk, Sean knew that she would never make it. She was calmer then, more rational. She had left her grief and her shame behind with his body, as she had been taught to do. The stillness and the cold were all around her, but the long hours of skiing had left her flushed and almost warm beneath her layers of leather and fur. Her thoughts had the brittle clarity of the ice that hung in long spears from the bare, twisted trees around her. As darkness threw its cloak over the world, Sean sought shelter in the lee of the greatest of those trees, a massive black bark whose trunk was three meters across. She spread the fur cloak she had taken on a bare patch of ground and pulled her own woven cape over her like a blanket to shut out the rising wind. With her back to the trunk and her long knife drawn beneath her cape just in case, she slept a brief, wary sleep and woke in full night to contemplate her mistakes. The stars were out. She could see them peeking through the bare black branches above her. The ice wagon dominated the sky, bringing cold into the world, as it had for as long as Sean could remember. The driver's blue eyes glared down at her, mocking. It had been the ice wagon that killed Lane, she thought bitterly, not the vampire. The vampire had mauled him badly that night, when his bowstring broke as he tried to draw in their defense, but in another season, with Sean nursing him, he would have lived. In deep winter, he never had a chance. The cold crept in past all the defenses she had built for him. The cold drained away all his strength, all his ferocity. The cold left him a shrunken white thing, numb and pale, his lips tinged with blue. And now the driver of the ice wagon would claim his soul. And hers, too, she knew. 
she should have abandoned Lane to his fate. That was what Craig would have done, or Leela, any of them. There had never been any hope that he would live. Not in deep winter. Nothing lived in deep winter. The trees grew stark and bare in deep winter. The grass and the flowers perished. The animals all froze or went underground to sleep. Even the wind wolves and the vampires grew lean and fierce, and many starved to death before the thaw. As Sean would starve. They had already been running three days late when the vampire attacked them, and Lane had had them eating short rations. Afterward, he had been so weak. He had finished his own food on the fourth day, and Sean had started feeding him some of hers, never telling him. She had very little left now, and the safety of Karen Hall was still nearly two weeks of hard travel away. In deep winter, it might as well be two years. Curled beneath her cape, Sean briefly considered starting a fire. A fire would bring vampires. They could feel the heat three kilometers off. They would come stalking silently between the trees. Gaunt black shadows taller than Lane had been. Their loose skin flapping over skeletal limbs like dark cloaks, concealing the claws. Perhaps, if she lay in wait, she could take one by surprise. A full-grown vampire would feed her long enough to return to Karen Hall. She played with the idea in the darkness, and only reluctantly put it aside. Vampires could run across the snow as fast as an arrow in flight, scarcely touching the ground, and it was virtually impossible to see them by night. But they could see her very well, by the heat she gave off. Lighting a fire would only guarantee her a quick and relatively painless death. Sean shivered and gripped the hilt of her long knife more tightly for reassurance. Every shadow suddenly seemed to have a vampire crouched within it, and in the keening of the wind, she thought she could hear the flapping noise their skin made when they ran. Then, louder and very real, another noise reached her ears, an angry high-pitched whistling like nothing Sean had ever heard, and suddenly the black horizon was suffused with light, a flicker of ghostly blue radiance that outlined the naked bones of the forest and throbbed visibly against the sky. Sean inhaled sharply, a draft of ice down her raw throat, and struggled to her feet, half afraid she was under attack. But there was nothing. The world was cold and black and dead. Only the light lived, flickering dimly in the distance, beckoning, calling to her. She watched it for long minutes, thinking back on old John and the terrible stories he used to tell the children when they gathered round Karen Hall's great hearth. There are worse things than vampires, he would tell them. And remembering, Sean was suddenly a little girl again, sitting on the thick furs with her back to the fire, listening to John talk of ghosts and living shadows and cannibal families who lived in great castles built of bone. As abruptly as it had come, the strange light faded and was gone, and with it went the high-pitched noise. Sean had marked where it had shown, however. She took up her pack and fastened Lane's cloak about her for extra warmth, then began to don her skis. She was no child now, she told herself, and that light had been no ghost dance. Whatever it was, it might be her only chance. She took her poles in hand and set off toward it. Night travel was dangerous in the extreme, she knew. Craig had told her that a hundred times, and Lane as well. In the darkness, in the scant starlight, it was easy to go astray, to break a ski or a leg, or worse, and movement generated heat, heat that drew vampires from the deep of the woods. Better to lay low until dawn, when the nocturnal hunters had retired to their lairs. All of her training told her that, and all of her instincts. But it was deep winter and when she rested, the cold bit through even the warmest of furs. And Lane was dead, and she was hungry, and the light had been so close, so achingly close. So she followed it, going slowly, 
going carefully. And it seemed that this night she had a charm upon her. The terrain was all flatland, gentle to her, almost kind, and the snow cover was sparse enough so that neither root nor rock could surprise and trip her. No dark predators came gliding out of the night, and the only sound was the sound of her motion, the soft crackling of the snow crust beneath her skis. The forest grew steadily thinner as she moved, and after an hour, Sean emerged from it entirely, into a wasteland of tumbled stone blocks and twisted, rusting metal. She knew what it was. She had seen other ruins before, where families had lived and died, and their halls and houses had gone all to rot, but never a ruin so extensive as this. The family that had lived here, however long ago, had been very great once. The shattered remains of their dwellings were more extensive than a hundred Karen halls. She began to pick a careful path through the crumbling, snow-dusted masonry. Twice she came upon structures that were almost intact, and each time she considered seeking shelter within those ancient stone walls. But there was nothing in either of them that might have caused the light, so Sean passed on after only a brief inspection. The river she came to soon thereafter stopped her for a slightly longer time. From the high bank where she paused, she could see the remains of two bridges that had once spanned the narrow channel, but both of them had fallen long ago. The river was frozen over, however, so she had no trouble crossing it. In deep winter the ice was thick and solid, and there was no danger of her falling through. As she climbed painstakingly up the far bank, Sean came upon the flower. It was a very small thing, its thick black stem emerging from between two rocks low on the riverbank. She might never have seen it in the night, but her pole dislodged one of the ice-covered stones as she struggled up the slope, and the noise made her glance down to where it grew. It startled her so that she took both poles in one hand and with the other fumbled in the deepest recesses of her clothing, so that she might risk a flame. The match gave a short, intense light, but it was enough. Sean saw. A flower. Tiny. So tiny. With four blue petals. Each the same pale blue shade that Lane's lips had been just before he died. A flower here. Alive. Growing in the eighth year of deep winter. When all the world was dead. They would never believe her, Sean thought not unless she brought the truth with her back to Karen Hall. She freed herself from her skis and tried to pick the flower. It was futile, as futile as her effort to bury Lane. The stem was as strong as metal wire. She struggled with it for several minutes and fought to keep from crying when it would not come. Craig would call her a liar, a dreamer, all the things he always called her. She did not cry, though, finally. She left the flower where it grew and climbed to the top of the river ridge. There she paused. Beneath her, going on and on for meters upon meters, was a wide, empty field. Snow stood in great drifts in some places, and in others there was only bare, flat stone, naked to the wind and the cold. In the center of the field was the strangest building Sean had ever seen, a great fat teardrop of a building that squatted like an animal in the starlight on three black legs. The legs were bent beneath it, flexed and rhymed over with ice at their joints, as if the beast had been about to leap straight up into the sky, and legs and building both were covered with flowers. There were flowers everywhere, Sean saw when she took her eyes off the squat building long enough to look. They sprouted, singly and in clusters, from every little crack in the field, with snow and ice all around them, making dark islands of life in the pure white stillness of deep winter. Sean walked through them, closer to the building, until she stood next to one of the legs and reached up to touch its joint wonderingly with a gloved hand. It was all metal metal and ice and flowers, like the building itself. Where each of the legs rested, 
The stone beneath had broken and fractured in a hundred places, as if shattered by some great blow, and vines grew from the crevices, twisting black vines that crawled around the flanks of the structure like the webs of a summer spinner. The flowers burst from the vines, and now that she stood up close, Sean saw that they were not like her little river bloom at all. There were blossoms of many colors, some as big as her head, growing in wild profusion everywhere, as if they did not realize that it was deep winter, when they should be black and dead. She was walking around the building looking for an entrance when a noise made her turn her head toward the ridge. A thin shadow flickered briefly against the snow, then seemed to vanish. Sean trembled and retreated quickly, putting the nearest of the tall legs to her back, and then she dropped everything, and Lane's sword was in her left hand and her own long knife in her right, and she stood cursing herself for that match, that stupid, stupid match, and listening for the flap, flap, flap of death on taloned feet. It was too dark, she realized, and her hand shook, and even as it did, the shape rushed upon her from the side. Her long knife flashed at it, stabbing, slicing, but cut only the skin cloak. And then the vampire gave a shriek of triumph, and Sean was buffeted to the ground, and she knew she was bleeding. There was a weight on her chest, and something black and leathery settled across her eyes, and she tried to knife it, and that was when she realized that her blade was gone. She screamed. Then the vampire screamed, and the side of Sean's head exploded in pain, and she had blood in her eyes, and she was choking on blood, and blood, and blood, and nothing more. It was blue, all blue, hazy, shifting blue, a pale blue, dancing, dancing, like the ghost light that had flickered on the sky, a soft blue, like the little flower the impossible blossom by the riverbank, a cold blue, like the eyes of the ice wagon's black driver, like Lane's lips when last she kissed them. Blue, blue, and it moved and would not be still. Everything was blurred, unreal. There was only blue, for a long time, only blue. Then music, but it was blurred music blue music somehow, strange and high and fleeting, very sad, lonely, a bit erotic. It was a lullaby, like old Tesenya used to sing when Sean was very little, before Tesenya grew weak and sick and Craig put her out to die. It had been so long since Sean had heard such a song. All the music she knew was Craig on his harp and Reese on her guitar. She found herself relaxing, floating, all her limbs turned to water, lazy water, though it was deep winter and she knew she should be ice. Soft hands began to touch her, lifting her head, pulling off her face mask so the blue warm brushed her naked cheeks, then drifting lower, lower, loosening her clothes, stripping her of furs and cloth and leather, off with her belt and off with her jerkin, and off with her pants. Her skin tingled. She was floating, floating. Everything was warm, so warm, and the hands fluttered here and there, and they were so gentle, like old Mother Tisenya had been, like her sister Leela was sometimes, like Devon. Like Lane, she thought, and it was a pleasant thought comforting and arousing at the same time, and Sean held close to it. She was with Lane. She was safe and warm and... And she remembered his face, the blue in his lips, the ice in his beard where his breath had frozen, the pain burned into him, twisting his features like a mask. She remembered, and suddenly she was drowning in the blue, choking on the blue, struggling, screaming, the hands lifted her, and a stranger's voice muttered something low and soothing in a language she did not understand. A cup was pressed to Sean's lips. She opened her mouth to scream again, but instead she was drinking, 
It was hot and sweet and fragrant, full of spices, and some of them were very familiar, but others she could not place at all. Tea, she thought, and her hands took it from the other hands as she gulped it down. She was in a small, dim room, propped up on a bed of pillows, and her clothes were piled next to her, and the air was full of blue mist from a burning stick. A woman knelt beside her, dressed in bright tatters of many different colors, and gray eyes regarded her calmly from beneath the thickest, wildest hair that Sean had ever seen. You? Who? Sean said. The woman stroked her brow with a pale, soft hand. Karen, she said clearly. Sean nodded, slowly, wondering who the woman was and how she knew the family. Karen Hall, the woman said, and her eyes seemed amused and a bit sad. Lynn and Eris and Kaith. I remember them, little girl. Beth. Voice Karen. How hard she was. And Kaya and Dale and Sean. Sean. I'm Sean, that's me. But Craig is voice Karen. The woman smiled faintly and continued to stroke Sean's brow. The skin of her hand was very soft. Sean had never felt anything so soft. Sean is my lover, the woman said. Every tenth year at gathering. Sean blinked at her, confused. She was beginning to remember. The light in the forest, the flowers, the vampire. Where am I? she asked. You are everywhere you never dreamed of being, little Karen, the woman said, and she laughed at herself. The walls of the room shone like dark metal, Sean noticed. The building, she blurted. The building on legs, with all the flowers. Yes, the woman said. Do you... Who are you? Did you make the light? I was in the forest, and Lane was dead, and I was nearly out of food, and I saw a light. A blue... That was my light, Karen child. As I came down from the sky, I was far away. Oh, yes, far away in lands you never heard of. But I came back. The woman stood up suddenly and whirled around and around, and the gaudy cloth she wore flapped and shimmered, and she was wreathed in pale blue smoke. I am the witch they warn you of in Karenhall, child, she yelled, exulting, and she whirled and whirled until finally, dizzy, she collapsed again beside Sean's bed. No one had ever warned Sean of a witch. She was more puzzled than afraid. You killed the vampire, she said. How did you... I am magic, the woman said. I am magic, and I can do magic things, and I will live forever. And so will you, Karen child, Sean, when I teach you. You can travel with me, and I will teach you all the magics and tell you stories, and we can be lovers. You are my lover already, you know. You've always been at gathering. Sean, Sean. She smiled. No, Sean said. That was some other person. You're tired, child. The vampire hurt you, and you don't remember. But you will remember. You will. She stood up and moved across the room, snuffing out the burning stick with her fingertips, quieting the music. When her back was turned, her hair fell nearly to her waist, and all of it was curls and tangles, wild, restless hair, tossing as she moved like the waves on the distant sea. Sean had seen the sea once, years ago, before deep winter came. She remembered. The woman faded the dim lights somehow and turned back to Sean in darkness. Rest now. I took away your pain with my magics, but it may come back. Call me if it does. I have other magics. 
Sean did feel drowsy. Yes, she murmured, unresisting. But when the woman moved to leave, Sean called out to her again. Wait, she said. Your family, mother. Tell me who you are. The woman stood framed in yellow light, a silhouette without features. My family is very great, child. My sisters are Lilith and Marcion and Erica Storm Jones and Lamia Bayliss and Deirdre Dalarain, Claronimus and Stephen Cobalt Northstar and Tomo and Wahlberg were all brothers to me and fathers. Our house is up past the ice wagon, and my name, my name is Morgan. And then she was gone, and the door closed behind her, and Sean was left to sleep. Morgan, she thought as she slept, Morgan, Morgan, Morgan. The name drifted through her dreams like smoke. She was very little and she was watching the fire in the hearth at Karen Hall, watching the flames lick and tease at the big black logs, smelling the sweet fragrances of thistlewood. And nearby someone was telling a story. Not John. No, this was before John had become storyteller. This was long ago. It was Tisenya, so very old, her face wrinkled, and she was talking in her tired voice so full of music, her lullaby voice, and all the children listened. Her stories had been different from John's. His were always about fighting, wars and vendettas and monsters, chock full with blood and knives and impassioned oaths sworn by a father's corpse. Tisenya was quieter. She told of a group of travelers, six of family Alin, who were lost in the wild one year during the season of freeze. They chanced upon a huge hall built all of metal, and the family within welcomed them with a great feast. So the travelers ate and drank, and just as they were wiping their lips to go, another banquet was served, and thus it went. The Alins stayed and stayed, for the food was richer and more delightful than any they had ever tasted, and the more they ate of it, the hungrier they grew. Besides, deep winter had set in outside the metal hall. Finally, when thaw came many years later, others of family Alin went searching for the six wanderers. They found them dead in the forest. They had put off their good warm furs and dressed in flimsies. Their steel had gone all to rust, and each of them had starved. For the name of the metal hall was Morgan Hall, Tisenya told the children, and the family who lived there was the family named Liar whose food is empty stuff, made of dreams and air. Sean woke naked and shivering. Her clothes were still piled next to her bed. She dressed quickly, first pulling on her undergarments, and over them a heavy black wool shift, and over that her leathers, pants and belt and jerkin, then her coat of fur with its hood, and finally the capes, Lane's cloak and her own of child's cloth. Last of all was her face mask. She pulled the taut leather down over her head and laced it close beneath her chin. And then she was safe from deep winter winds and strangers' touches both. Sean found her weapons thrown carelessly in a corner with her boots. When Lane's sword was in her hand and her long knife back in its familiar sheath, she felt complete again. She stepped outside, determined to find skis and exit. Morgan met her with laughter bright and brittle, in a chamber of glass and shining silver metal. She stood framed against the largest window Sean had ever seen, a sheet of pure clean glass taller than a man and wider than Karen Hall's great hearth, even more flawless than the mirrors of family tourists, who were famed for their glass blowers and lens makers. Beyond the glass it was midday, the cool blue midday of deep winter. Sean saw the field of stone and snow and flowers, and beyond it the low ridge that she had climbed, and beyond that the frozen river winding through the ruins. You look so fierce and angry, Morgan said when her silly laughter had stopped. She had been threading her wild hair with wisps of cloth, 
and gems on silver clips that sparkled when she moved. Come, caring child, take off your furs again. The cold can't touch us here, and if it does, we can leave it. There are other lands, you know. She walked across the room. Sean had let the point of her sword droop toward the floor. Now she jerked it up again. Stay away, she warned. Her voice sounded hoarse and strange. I am not afraid of you, Sean, Morgan said. Not you, my Sean, my lover. She moved around the sword easily and took off the scarf she wore, a gossamer of gray spider silk set with tiny crimson jewels, to drape it around Sean's neck. See, I know what you were thinking, she said, pointing to the jewels. One by one they were changing color. Fire became blood, blood crusted and turned brown, brown faded to black. You are frightened of me, nothing more, no anger. You would never hurt me. She tied the scarf neatly under Sean's face mask and smiled. Sean stared at the gems with horror. How did you do that? she demanded, backing off uncertainly. With magic, Morgan said. She spun on her heels and danced back to the window. Morgan is full of magic. You are full of lies, Sean said. I know about the six Alins. I'm not going to eat here and starve to death. Where are my skis? Morgan seemed not to hear her. The older woman's eyes were clouded. Wistful. Have you ever seen a Lynn house in summer, child? It's very beautiful. The sun comes up over the redstone tower and sinks every night into Jemay's lake. Do you know it, Sean? No, Sean said boldly. And you don't either. What do you talk about a Lynn house for? You said your family lived on the ice wagon and they all had names I never heard of, Cleroboros and things like that. Cleronomos, Morgan said, giggling. She raised her hand to her mouth to still herself and chewed on a finger idly while her gray eyes shone. All her fingers were ringed with bright metal. You should see my brother Cleronomos, child. He is half of metal and half of flesh, and his eyes are bright as glass. And he knows more than all the voices who've ever spoken for Karen Hall. He does not, Sean said. You're lying again. He does, Morgan said. Her hand fell, and she looked cross. He's magic. We all are. Erica died, but she wakes up to live again and again and again. Stephen was a warrior. He killed a billion families, more than you can count. And Celia found a lot of secret places that no one had ever found before. My family all does magic things. Her expression grew suddenly sly. I killed the vampire, didn't I? How do you think I did that? With a knife, Sean said fiercely, but beneath her mask she flushed. Morgan had killed the vampire. That meant there was a debt. And she had drawn steel. She flinched under Craig's imagined fury and dropped the sword to clatter on the floor. All at once she was very confused. Morgan's voice was gentle. But you had a long knife and a sword. And you couldn't kill the vampire, could you, child? No. She came across the room. You are mine, Sean Karen. You are my lover and my daughter and my sister. You have to learn to trust. I have much to teach you. Here. She took Sean by the hand and led her to the window. Stand here. Wait, Sean. Wait and watch, and I will show you more of Morgan's magics. At the far wall, smiling, she did something with her rings to a panel of bright metal and square dim lights. Watching, Sean grew suddenly afraid. 
Beneath her feet the floor began to shake, and a sound assaulted her, a high, whining shriek that stabbed at her ears through the leather mask until she clapped her gloved hands on either side of her head to shut it out. Even then she could hear it, like a vibration in her bones. Her teeth ached, and she was aware of a sudden shooting pain up in her left temple. And that was not the worst of it, for outside, where everything had been cold and bright and still, a somber blue light was shifting and dancing and staining all the world. The snowdrifts were a pale blue, and the plumes of frozen powder that blew from each of them were paler still, and blue shadows came and went upon the river ridge where none had been before. And Sean could see the light reflected even on the river itself, and on the ruins that stood desolate and broken upon the farther crest. Morgan was giggling behind her, and then everything in the window began to blur until there was nothing to be seen at all, only colors, colors bright and dark running together, like pieces of a rainbow melting in some vast stewpot. Sean did not budge from where she stood, but her hand fell to the hilt of her long knife, and despite herself, she trembled. Look, Karen child, Morgan shouted over the terrible whine. Sean could barely hear her. We've jumped up into the sky now, away from all that cold. I told you, Sean, we're going to ride the ice wagon now. And she did something to the wall again, and the noise vanished, and the colors were gone. Beyond the glass was sky. Sean cried out in fear. She could see nothing except darkness and stars, stars everywhere, more than she had ever seen before. And she knew she was lost. Lane had taught her all the stars, so she could use them for a guide, find her way from anywhere to anywhere. But these stars were wrong, were different. She could not find the ice wagon, or the ghost skier, or even Lara Karen with her windwolves. She could find nothing familiar, only stars. Stars that leered at her like a million eyes, red and white and blue and yellow, and none of them would even blink. Morgan was standing behind her. Are we in the ice wagon? Sean asked in a small voice. Yes. Sean trembled, threw away her knife so that it bounded noisily off a metal wall, and turned to face her host. Then we're dead, and the driver is taking our souls off to the frozen waste, she said. She did not cry. She had not wanted to be dead, especially not in deep winter, but at least she would see Lane again. Morgan began to undo the scarf she had fastened round Sean's neck. The stones were black and frightening. No, Sean Karen. She said evenly, we are not dead. Live here with me, child, and you will never die. You'll see. She pulled off the scarf and started unlacing the thongs of Sean's face mask. When it was loose, she pulled it up and off the girl's head, tossing it casually to the floor. You're pretty, Sean. You have always been pretty, though. I remember. All those years ago, I remember. I'm not pretty, Sean said. I'm too soft, and I'm too weak, and Craig says I'm skinny, and my face is all pushed in, and I'm not, Morgan shushed her with a touch to her lips, and then unfastened her neck clasp. Lane's battered cloak slipped from her shoulders. Her own cape followed, and then her coat was off and Morgan's fingers moved down to the laces of her jerkin. No, Sean said, suddenly shying away. Her back pressed up against the great window, and she felt the awful night laying its weight upon her. I can't, Morgan. I'm Karen, and you're not family. I can't. Gathering, Morgan whispered. Pretend this is gathering. Sean, you've always been my lover during the gathering. Sean's throat was dry. But it isn't gathering, she insisted. She had seen one gathering down by the sea, when forty families came together to trade news and goods and love. But that had been years before her blood, so no one had taken her. 
she was not yet a woman, and thus untouchable. It isn't gathering, she repeated, close to tears. Morgan giggled. Very well. I am no Karen, but I am Morgan full of magic. I can make it gathering. She darted across the room on bare feet and thrust her rings against the wall once more and moved them this way and that in a strange pattern. Then she called out, Look, turn and look. Sean, confused, glanced back at the window. Under the double suns of high summer, the world was bright and green. Sailing ships moved languidly on the slow-flowing waters of the river, and Sean could see the bright reflections of the twin suns bobbing and rolling in their wake, balls of soft yellow butter afloat upon the blue. Even the sky seemed sweet and buttery. White clouds moved like the stately schooners of family Crean, and nowhere could a star be seen. The far shore was dotted by houses, houses small as a road shelter and greater than even Karen Hall, towers as tall and sleek as the wind-carved rocks in the broken mountains. And here and there, and all among them, people moved, lithe, swarthy folk strange to Sean, and people of the families, too, all mingling together. The stone field was free of snow and ice, but there were metal buildings everywhere, some larger than Morgan Hall, many smaller, each with its distinctive markings, and every one of them squatting on three legs. Between the buildings were the tents and stalls of the families, with their sigils and their banners, and mats, the gaily colored lovers' mats. Sean saw people coupling, and felt Morgan's hand resting lightly on her shoulder. Do you know what you are seeing, Karen child? Morgan whispered. Sean turned back to her with fear and wonder in her eyes. It is gathering. Morgan smiled. You see, she said, it is gathering, and I claim you. Celebrate with me. And her fingers moved to the buckle on Sean's belt, and Sean did not resist. Within the metal walls of Morgan Hall, seasons turned to hours, turned to years, turned to days, turned to months, turned to weeks, turned to seasons once again. Time had no sense. When Sean awoke, on a shaggy fur that Morgan had spread beneath the window, high summer had turned back into deep winter, and the families, ships, and gathering were gone. Dawn came earlier than it should have, and Morgan seemed annoyed, so she made it dusk. The season was freeze, with its ominous chill, and where the stars of sunrise had shone, now gray clouds raced across a copper-colored sky. They ate while the copper turned to black. Morgan served mushrooms and crunchy summer greens, dark bread dripping with honey and butter, creamed spice tea, and thick cuts of red meat floating in blood. And afterward there was flavored ice with nuts, and finally a tall hot drink with nine layers, each a different color with a different taste. They sipped the drink from glasses of impossibly thin crystal, and it made Sean's head ache. And she began to cry, because the food had seemed real, and all of it was good, but she was afraid that if she ate any more of it she would starve to death. Morgan laughed at her and slipped away, and returned with dried leathery strips of vampire meat. She told Sean to keep it in her pack and munch on it whenever she felt hungry. Sean kept the meat for a long time, but never ate from it. At first, she tried to keep track of the days by counting the meals they ate and how many times they slept, but soon the changing scenes outside the window and the random nature of life in Morgan Hall confused her past any hope of understanding. She worried about it for weeks, or perhaps only for days, and then she ceased to worry. Morgan could make time do anything she pleased, so there was no sense in Sean caring about it. Several times Sean asked to leave, but Morgan would have none of it. She only laughed and did some great magic that made Sean forget about everything. Morgan took her blades away one night when she was asleep, and all her furs and leathers too, and afterward 
Sean was forced to dress as Morgan wanted her to dress, in clouds of colored silk and fantastic tatters, or in nothing at all. She was angry and upset at first, but later she grew used to it. Her old clothing would have been much too hot inside Morgan Hall anyway. Morgan gave her gifts, bags of spice that smelled of summer, a wind wolf fashioned of pale blue glass, a metal mask that let Sean see in the dark, scented oils for her bath, and bottles of a slow golden liquor that brought her forgetfulness when her mind was troubled. A mirror, the finest mirror that had ever been. Books that Sean could not read. A bracelet set with small red stones that drank in light all day and glowed by night. Cubes that played exotic music when Sean warmed them with her hand. Boots woven of metal that were so light and flexible she could crumple them up in the palm of one hand. Metal miniatures of men and women and all manner of demons. Morgan told her stories. Each gift she gave to Sean had a story that went with it, a tale of where it came from and who had made it and how it had come here. Morgan told them all. There were tales for each of her relatives as well. Indomitable Claronimus, who drove across the sky hunting for knowledge. Celia Marcian, the ever-curious, and her ship Shadow Chaser. Erica Storm Jones, whose family cut her up with knives that she might live again. Savage Stephen Cobalt Northstar. Melancholy Tomo, bright Deirdre Dalarain, and her grim ghostly twin. Those stories Morgan told with magic. There was a place in one wall with a small square slot in it, and Morgan would go there and insert a flat metallic box, and then all the lights would go out, and Morgan's dead relatives would live again, bright phantoms who walked and talked and dripped blood when they were hurt. Sean thought they were real until the day when Deirdre first wept for her slain children, and Sean ran to comfort her and found they could not touch. It was not until afterward that Morgan told her Deirdre and the others were only spirits, called down by her magic. Morgan told her many things. Morgan was her teacher, as well as her lover, and she was nearly as patient as Lane had been, though much more prone to wander and lose interest. She gave Sean a beautiful twelve-stringed guitar and began to teach her to play it, and she taught her to read a little, and she taught her a few of the simpler magics, so Sean could move easily around the ship. That was another thing that Morgan taught her. Morgan Hall was no building, after all, but a ship, a sky ship that could flex its metal legs and leap from star to star. Morgan told her about the planets, lands out by those far-off stars, and said that all the gifts she had given Sean had come from out there, from beyond the ice wagon. The mask and mirror were from Jameson's world the books and cubes from Avalon, the bracelet from High Cavalon, the oils from Brock, the spices from Rhiannon and Tara and Old Poseidon, the boots from Bastion, the figurines from Chul Damien, the golden liquor from a land so far away that even Morgan did not know its name. Only the fine glass windwolf had been made here on Sean's world, Morgan said. The windwolf had always been one of Sean's favorites, but now she found she did not like it half so well as she had thought she did. The others were all so much more exciting. Sean had always wanted to travel, to visit distant families in wild, distant climes, to gaze on seas and mountains. But she had been too young, and when she finally reached her womanhood, Craig would not let her go. She was too slow, he said, too timid, too irresponsible. Her life would be spent at home where she could put her meager talents to better use for Karen Hall. Even the fateful trip that had led her here had been a fluke. Lane had insisted, and Lane alone of all the others was strong enough to stand up to Craig, voice Karen. Morgan took her traveling, though, on sails between the stars. When blue fire flickered against the icy landscape of deep winter and the sound rose up out of nowhere higher and higher, Sean would rush eagerly to the window, where she would wait with mounting impatience for the colors to clear. Morgan gave her all the mountains and all the seas she could dream of, and more. 
through the flawless glass, Sean saw the lands from all the stories. Old Poseidon, with its weathered docks and its fleets of silver ships, the meadows of Rhiannon, the vaulting black steel towers of I. Emerald, High Cavallon's windswept plains and rugged hills, the island cities of Port Jameson and Jolistar on Jameson's world. Sean learned about cities from Morgan, and suddenly the ruins by the river seemed different in her eyes. She learned about other ways of living as well, about arcologies and holdfasts and brotherhoods, about bond companies and slavery and armies. Family Karen no longer seemed the beginning and the end of human loyalties. Of all the places they sailed to, they came to Avalon most often, and Sean learned to love it best. On Avalon, the landing field was always full of other wanderers, and Sean could watch ships come and go on wands of pale blue light, and in the distance she could see the buildings of the Academy of Human Knowledge, where Claronimus had deposited all his secrets so that they might be held in trust for Morgan's family. Those jagged glass towers filled Sean with a longing that was almost a hurt, but a hurt that she somehow craved. Sometimes, on several of the worlds, but most particularly on Avalon, it seemed to Sean that some stranger was about to board their ship. She would watch them come, striding purposefully across the field, their destination clear from every step. They never came aboard, though, much to her disappointment. There was never anyone to touch or talk to except Morgan. Sean suspected that Morgan magicked the would-be visitors away or else lured them to their doom. She could not quite make up her mind which. Morgan was so moody that it might be both. One dinner time she remembered John's story of the cannibal hall, and looked down with horror at the red meat they were eating. She ate only vegetables that meal, and for several meals thereafter, until she finally decided that she was being childish. Sean considered asking Morgan about the strangers who approached and vanished, but she was afraid. She remembered Craig, whose temper was awful if you asked him the wrong question, and if the older woman was really killing those who tried to board her ship, it would not be wise to mention it to her. When Sean was just a child, Craig had beaten her savagely for asking why old Tisenya had to go outside and die. Other questions Sean did ask, only to find that Morgan would not answer. Morgan would not talk about her own origins, or the source of their food, or the magic that flew the ship. Twice Sean asked to learn the spells that moved them from star to star, and both times Morgan refused with anger in her voice. She had other secrets from Sean as well. There were rooms that would not open to Sean, things that she was not allowed to touch, other things that Morgan would not even talk about. From time to time, Morgan would disappear for what seemed like days, and Sean would wander desolately, with nothing outside the window to occupy her but steady, unwinking stars. On those occasions, Morgan would be somber and secretive when she returned, but only for a few hours, after which she would return to normal. For Morgan, though, normal was different than for other people. She would dance about the ship endlessly, singing to herself, sometimes with Sean as a dancing partner, and sometimes alone. She would converse with herself in a musical tongue that Sean did not know. She would be alternately as serious as a wise old mother, and three times as knowledgeable as a voice, and as giddy and giggly as a child of one season. Sometimes Morgan seemed to know just who Sean was, and sometimes she insisted on confusing her with that other Sean Karen who had loved her during gathering. She was very patient and very impetuous. She was unlike anyone that Sean had ever met before. You're silly, Sean told her once. You wouldn't be so silly if you lived in Karen Hall. Silly people die, you know, and they hurt their families. Everyone has to be useful, and you're not useful. Craig would make you be useful. You're lucky that you aren't a Karen. Morgan had only caressed her, and gazed at her from sad, gray eyes. Poor Sean, she'd whispered. 
They've been so hard to you. But the Karens were always hard. A Lin house was different, child. You should have been born an Alin. And after that, she would say no more of it. Sean squandered her days in wonder and her nights in love, and she thought of Karen Hall less and less, and gradually she found that she had come to care for Morgan as if she were family, and more, she had come to trust her. Until the day she learned about the bitter blooms. Sean woke up one morning to find that the window was full of stars, and Morgan had vanished. That usually meant a long, boring wait. But this time, Sean was still eating the food that Morgan had left out for her when the older woman returned with her hands full of pale blue flowers. She was so eager. Sean had never seen her so eager. She made Sean leave her breakfast half-eaten and come across the room to the fur rug by the window so that she could wind the flowers in Sean's hair. I saw while you were sleeping, child, she said happily as she worked. Your hair has grown long. It used to be so short, chopped off and ugly. But you've been here long enough, and now it's better, long like mine. The bitter blooms will make it best of all. Bitter blooms? Sean asked, curious. Is that what you call them? I never knew. Yes, child, Morgan replied, still fussing and arranging. Sean had her back to her, so she could not see her face. The little blue ones are the bitter blooms. They flower even in the bitterest cold, so that's why they call them that. Originally, they came from a world named Emir, very far off, where they have winters nearly as long and cold as we do. The other flowers are from Emir, too, the ones that grow on the vines around the ship. Those are called frost flowers. Deep winter is always so bleak, so I planted them to make everything look nicer. She took Sean by the shoulder and turned her around. You look like me now, she said. Go and get your mirror and see for yourself, Karen child. It's over there, Sean answered and she darted around Morgan to get it. Her bare foot came down in something cold and wet. She flinched from it and made a noise. There was a puddle on the rug. Sean frowned. She stood very still and looked at Morgan. The woman had not removed her boots. They dripped. And behind Morgan, there was nothing to be seen but blackness and unfamiliar stars. Sean was afraid. Something was very wrong. Morgan was looking at her uneasily. She wet her lips, then smiled shyly, and went to get the mirror. Morgan magicked the stars away before she went to sleep. It was night outside their window, but a gentle night, far from the frozen rigor of deep winter. Leafy trees swayed in the wind on the perimeter of their landing field, and a moon overhead made everything bright and beautiful. A good, safe world to sleep on, Morgan said. Sean did not sleep. She sat across the room from Morgan, staring at the moon. For the first time since she had come to Morgan Hall, she was using her mind like a Karen. Lane would have been proud of her. Craig would only have asked what took her so long. Morgan had returned with a handful of bitter blooms, and boots wet with snow. But outside had been nothing, only the emptiness that Morgan said filled the space between the stars. Morgan said that the light Sean had seen in the forest had been the fires of her ship as it landed. But the thick vines of the frost flowers grew in and around and over the legs of that ship, and they had been growing for years. Morgan would not let her go outside. Morgan showed her everything through the great window, but Sean could not remember seeing any window when she had been outside Morgan Hall. And if the window was a window, where were the vines that should have crept across it, the deep winter frost that should have covered it? For the name of the metal hall was Morgan Hall, Tasenya told the children, and the family who lived there was the family named Lyre, 
whose food is empty stuff made of dreams and air. Shauna rose in the lie of moonlight and went to where she kept the gifts that Morgan had given her. She looked at them each in turn and lifted the heaviest of them, the glass windwolf. It was a large sculpture, hefty enough so that Sean used two hands to lift it, one hand on the creature's snarling snout, the other around its tail. Morgan, she shouted. Morgan sat up drowsily and smiled. Sean, she murmured. Sean, child, what are you doing with your windwolf? Sean advanced and lifted the glass animal high above her head. You lied to me. We've never gone anywhere. We're still in the ruined city, and it's still deep winter. Morgan's face was somber. You don't know what you're saying. She got shakily to her feet. Are you going to hit me with that thing, child? I'm not afraid of it. Once you held a sword on me, and I wasn't afraid of you then, either. I am Morgan, full of magic. You cannot hurt me, Sean. I want to leave, Sean said. Bring me my blades and my clothing, my old clothing. I'm going back to Karen Hall. I am a woman of Karen, not a child. You've made a child of me. Bring me food, too. Morgan giggled. So serious. And if I don't... If you don't, Sean said, then I'll throw this right through your window. She hefted the windwolf for emphasis. No, Morgan said. Her expression was unreadable. You don't want to do that, child. I will, Sean said, unless you do as I say. You don't want to leave me, Sean Karen. No, you don't. We're lovers, remember. We're family. I can do magics for you. Her voice trembled. Put that down, child. I'll show you things I never showed you before. There are so many places we can go together, so many stories I can tell you. Put that down, she was pleading. Sean could sense triumph. Oddly enough, there were tears in her eyes. Why are you so afraid? she demanded angrily. You can fix a broken window with your magic, can't you? Even I can fix a broken window, and Craig says I'm hardly good for anything at all. The tears were rolling down her naked cheeks now. But silently. Silently. It's warm outside. You can see that. And there's moonlight to work by. And even a city. You could hire a glazier. I don't see why you were so afraid. It isn't as if it were deep winter out there, with cold and ice, vampires gliding through the dark. It isn't like that. No, Morgan said. No. No, Sean echoed. Bring me my things. Morgan did not move. It wasn't all lies. It wasn't. If you stay with me, you'll live for a long time. I think it's the food... But it's true. A lot of it was true, Sean. I didn't mean to lie to you. I wanted it to be best, the way it was for me at first. You just have to pretend, you know. Forget that the ship can't move. It's better that way. Her voice sounded young, frightened. She was a woman, and she begged like a little girl, in a little girl's voice. Don't break the window. The window is the most magic thing. It can take us anywhere, almost. Please, please don't break it, Sean. Don't. Morgan was shaking. The fluttering rags she wore seemed faded and shabby suddenly, and her rings did not sparkle. She was just a crazy old woman. Sean lowered the heavy glass windwolf. I want my clothing, and my sword, and my skis, and food. Lots and lots of food. Bring it to me, and maybe I won't break your window. Liar. Do you hear me? And Morgan, no longer full of magic, nodded and did as she was told. 
Sean watched her in silence. They never spoke again. Sean returned to Karen Hall and grew old. Her return was a sensation. She had been missing for more than a standard year, she discovered, and everyone had presumed that both she and Lane were dead. Craig refused to believe her story at first, and the others followed his lead until Sean produced a handful of bitter blooms that she had picked from her hair. Even then, Craig could not accept the more fanciful parts of her tale. Illusions, he snorted. Every bit of it illusion. Tesenya told it true. If you went back, your magic ship would be gone, with no sign that it had ever been there. Believe me, Sean. But it was never clear to her whether Craig truly believed himself. He issued orders, and no man or woman of family Karen ever went that way again. Things were different at Karen Hall after Sean's return. The family was smaller. Lane's was not the only face she missed at the meal table. Food had grown very short while she had been away, and Craig, as was the custom, had sent the weakest and most useless out to die. John was among the missing. Leela was gone, too. Leela, who had been so young and strong. A vampire had taken her three months ago. But not everything was sadness. Deep winter was ending, and on a more personal level, Sean found that her position in the family had changed. Now even Craig treated her with a rough respect. A year later, when Thaw was well underway, she bore her first child and was accepted as an equal into the councils of Karen Hall. Sean named her daughter Lane. She settled easily into family life. When it was time for her to choose a permanent profession, she asked to be a trader and was surprised to find that Craig did not speak against her choice. Reese took her as apprentice, and after three years, she got an assignment of her own. Her work kept her on the road a great deal. When she was home in Karen Hall, however, Sean found to her surprise that she had become the favored family storyteller. The children said she knew the best stories of anyone. Craig, never practical, said that her fancies set a bad example for the children and had no proper lesson to them. But by that time he was very sick, a victim of high summer fever, and his opposition carried little weight. He died soon after, and Devon became voice, a gentler and more moderate voice than Craig. Family Karen had a generation of peace while he spoke for Karen Hall, and their numbers increased from forty to nearly one hundred. Sean was frequently his lover. Her reading had improved a great deal by then, through long study, and Devon once yielded to her whim and showed her the secret library of the voices, where each voice for untold centuries had kept a journal detailing the events of his service. As Sean had suspected, one of the thicker volumes was called The Book of Beth, Voice Karen. It was about sixty years old. Lane was the first of nine children for Sean. She was lucky. Six of them lived, two fathered by family, and four that she brought back with her from gathering. Devon honored her for bringing so much fresh blood into Karen Hall, and later another voice would name her for exceptional prowess as a traitor. She traveled widely, met many families, saw waterfalls and volcanoes, as well as seas and mountains, sailed halfway around the world on a Korean schooner. She had many lovers and much esteem. Janice followed Devon as voice, but she had a bitter, unhappy time of it, and when she passed, the mothers and fathers of family Karen offered the position to Sean. She turned it down. It would not have made her happy. Despite everything she had done, she was not a happy person. She remembered too much, and sometimes she could not sleep very well at night. During the fourth deep winter of her life, the family numbered 237, fully a hundred of them children, but game was scarce, even in the third year after freeze, and Sean could see the hard, cold times approaching. The voice was a kind woman who found it hard to make the decisions that had to be made, but Sean knew what was coming. She was the second eldest of those in Karen Hall. One night she stole some food, just enough, two weeks' traveling supply, 
and a pair of skis, left Karen Hall at dawn, and spared the voice the giving of the order. She was not so fast as she had been when she was young. The journey took closer to three weeks than two, and she was lean and weak when she finally entered the ruined city. But the ship was just as she had left it. Extremes of heat and cold had cracked the stone of the spacefield over the years, and the alien flowers had taken advantage of every little opening. The stone was dotted with bitter blooms, and the frost flower vines that twined around the ship were twice as thick as Sean remembered them. The big, brightly colored blossoms stirred faintly in the wind. Nothing else moved. She circled the ship three times, waiting for a door to open, waiting for someone to see her and appear. But if the metal noticed her presence, it gave no sign. On the far side of the ship, Sean found something she hadn't seen before. Writing, faded but still legible, obscured only by ice and flowers. She used her long knife to shatter the ice and cut the vines so she might read. It said, Morgan Le Fay. Registry, Avalon, 476-3319. Sean smiled. So even her name had been a lie. Well, it did not matter now. She cupped her gloved hands together over her mouth. Morgan! she shouted. It's Sean! The wind whipped her words away from her. Let me in, Morgan. Lie to me, Morgan, full of magic. I'm sorry. Lie to me and make me believe. There was no answer. Sean dug herself a hollow in the snow and sat down to wait. She was tired and hungry, and dusk was close at hand. Already she could see the driver's ice-blue eyes staring through the wispy clouds of twilight. When at last she slept, she dreamt of Avalon. <laughs>